Welcome to this third lecture, third module of COP2510, uh, devoted to iterative statements. Uh, we are going to uh, cover repetition statement, iterative statement, looping in uh, in your programs, uh, just in a similar way that we covered conditional statement. Okay, we are going to discuss when you have multiple iterative statement in a program, how to arrange them serially. Oops, let me go back and switch to the pen tool. How to arrange them serially, how to arrange them in a nested manner. One difference between this lecture and the previous one will be that we are going to be a little bit more in depth concerning how to use even a single iterative statement because we are going to present to you two different strategies, the so-called counter-based strategy and the so-called sentinel strategy. So we're going to start with this and more specifically how to use an iterative statement a loop in one of your program uh, you, uh, using a counter based uh, strategy. So this slide is going to show you as we used already in the previous lecture very generic patterns of code. Okay as you can see on your right we have the archetype if you will of a loop a flowchart. The yellow box is here are there to be replaced by everything that you need, every statement, like 200 statements in each box, maybe if you need so. Uh, they are there to be replaced by the statement you need to do your work, to solve a specific problem. The rest, all the other boxes, are there to give you a sort of empty skeleton, very generic skeleton of flowchart that you can reuse in many, many different problems, and which represent what you need to do to implement a counter-based iteration, a counter-based loop. So what do we need by what do we mean by counter-based loop? Well there are two kinds of loops. The loops for which you know exactly how many times you want to do something. For example, uh, repeat ten times, display hello on the screen. Well that's kind of easy. You know that you are going to display hello on the screen ten times. Okay? What other type of loop can you find? Well you can find loops that have the form um, display every character in this text file until you reach the end of the file. The former type of loop is appropriately called counter-based loop. The second type of loop is called sentinel-based loop. Why? Well, because uh, doing something until you reach the end of file means that you will read every character from a text file until you read the special mark that indicates that the file is over. The special mark is called the sentinel value. Let me give you another example. You write a program with a loop that keeps asking an integer from 0 to 10 from the user. And for example, just sum them all. Well, how are you going to quit this program? You can, for instance, tell the user, please give me a number from 0 to 10, or enter minus 1, if you wish to quit this program. That's it. That's your sentinel value. That's a special value that has nothing to do with the data that you process in the loop normally, but that will indicate simply that it's time to break out of the loop. Back to counter-based uh, iteration. We have here an example of counter-based loop. How does it work? Well, first, you will need a counting variable. Okay, just a small variable, integer variable, to keep track of how many times you have iterated so far and to decide if it's time for you to stop iterating or not. In this example, we chose to name this variable counter. You could name it whatever you want, really, okay? As long as you use a name that is meaningful enough to indicate that this is the counter variable for this particular loop. If you have multiple loops in a single program, whether they are nested or whether they are serially arranged, you need to be careful to use different counter variable in each of them. There are very few exceptions, there are very few cases in which you will want to use the same counter uh, variable for multiple loops. Uh, one of the live coding exercise will go over such an example, but generally speaking, each loop need its, needs its own counter to keep track of how many times it iterated already and when it will going to have to stop. So you you must be careful about making sure that each loop has a different variable name. Okay? So in this example it's relatively easy. We have a single loop. The counter variable is named counter. We start by initializing the counter variable and I write init here with my bad handwriting. We start initializing this counter variable to one. 
What is the next step? Well, the next step is not really a statement that does anything. It's represented here by this oval labeled loop. This is just a mark in your program, and Raptor is going to use exactly the same notation. It's just a mark in your program that indicates that later on, we can go ahead and branch back execution to this mark. Okay? After this, what do we have? We have one of those yellow box that you can replace by just about how many statements you need to actually do your work. So I label that box, do some work. This is what you need and what you want to be repeated over and over in this loop. Okay? After that, very important step. Counter is equal to counter plus one. Well, let's say that this is the variable counter in memory. I abbreviate it with a C. The variable counter, because of the initialization, contains the value 1. When I reach this statement here, here is the expression I'm evaluating. Counter is assigned counter plus 1. Well, I know that I'm going to assign this value to the variable counter. This value is represented here by a mathematic expression, an arithmetic expression. So it's an addition of 1 with C, counter. What is the current content of the variable counter? 1. So this expression is equivalent to 1 plus 1, which I can very easily evaluate to 2, and then I assign the value 2 as the new value of the variable counter. So now the variable counter contains the value 2. Okay, so this is this is very important. And I'm going to to give it a couple of seconds so that I have time to explain to you the next step, and I'll come back to why this is so important. Okay, this is the counter incrementation step of our loop, incrementation of the counter variable. Then we have the test. This test is meant to tell us if we have to stop iterating or not. It's using a conditional. Okay, inside of the conditional, we have a Boolean expression. The Boolean expression here is very simple. Is counter equal to 10? Okay, so my apologies here. I use a double equal sign that is used in Java, C, C++ language. When you are using Raptor, you will use a single equal sign. So counter equal to 10 is going to be the condition you put in your loop conditional to decide whether you are going to stop iterating or not. If this condition is true, I go to the next statement after my loop, and I do some over work, maybe an over loop, maybe a conditional, etc. If this condition is false, then I just keep iterating. And to do so, I connect back to the loop label here, and I'm going to start again executing uh, the statements inside of my loop. Okay? All right, couple of things I need to draw your attention to. First thing, the initialization. The initialization here decides to initialize variable counter to value 1. Well, why starting at 1? Why not starting at 0? So we have here already a question. Okay, We initialize to 1 or we initialize to 0. What, what is the difference starting at 1, starting at 0? Well, I'm going to illustrate that in an example in a couple of seconds, but the idea is that it represents the difference between counting I did my job one time after the job is done or starting iteration by assuming, well, I assume I already did it once. What can that do in terms of a computer program? Well, that can easily lead to a off by one type of error. What does that mean, off by one? Well, that means that I write this program here to repeat a certain job 10 times. And when I execute it, I, re I realize it that the job is repeated 9 times or 11 times. This is a very classic error for beginner programmers, especially when you are just you know, learning to use loops, etc. And most of the time, it has to do with how you initialize your counting variable, or it has to do with how you increment it, or even how you test it. So you see, there are like three main parts to, to building a loop, a counter-based a counter based loop. Initialization, increment, and test. And each of those parts can lead very easily to bugs. Another thing I want to, uh, to show you real quick with this very simple example. What if I decide here 
to increment by 2 at each iteration. What would happen? Well, there are different ways to understand code. One way to understand code is to just glance at it, generate an hypothesis or an assumption about what it does, and work with this for half an hour. Uh, generally, this is a good way, except if you're already a veteran programmer, to waste your time and the time of other people. The right way for you to understand code at your level is to trace it, is to go step by step, read it with the rigor and discipline that we mentioned uh, since our first lecture, and determine what each statement is doing. To do that kind of tracing, well, you can do it in your head once you get used to it. But at your level, I would recommend to use paper and to write down things. Too many students are actually never making the effort to write down anything and try to learn by doing and rather stare at the code for like half an hour before to figure out that they cannot find the error because they don't have any basis to base their reasoning on. So let's not do that and let's get started with good habits from the beginning. So I'm going to take this code and I'm going to try to understand what incrementing by two instead of one is going to change. So this is the content of the variable counter. When I initialize it, it's assign the value 1. Then I enter my loop here. I do some work which I'm going to represent here by making an X on the screen every time this statement or group of statement is executed. Then I increment the variable counter. 1 plus 2 is equal to 3. Then I test. Is counter equal to 10? Not yet. So I go back and I loop again. I do some work. Counter is equal to counter plus 2. So now counter is equal to 5. A test. Is counter equal to 10? No. I loop again. I do some work. Counter is equal to counter plus 2. Counter is now equal to 7. Is counter equal to 10? No. I loop again. I do some work. Counter is equal to counter plus 2. Counter is now equal to 9. Is counter 10? Not yet. I loop again. I do some work. Counter is equal to counter plus 2. Counter is 11. Is counter 10? No. I loop again. And now you should see the problem. Counter is already equal to 11. We are going to keep incrementing it each time we iterate. Counter will never be equal to 10 ever. We have here an example of infinite loop. And this is another, I would say, classical bug when you're learning to, to work with loop. Actually, even when you are like a, a, seasoned, uh, a seasoned programmer, you will sometimes generate infinite loops. So that's the second type of bugs that we can have with even such an easy program, okay, an easy loop. So what happened here? Well, let me use this this error to illustrate again my point about the, the difficulty to initialize correctly a counting variable. If you decide to start counting at 1 and you increment by 1, your loop will terminate one day. Okay, you will reach the value 10. Now, if you decide to increment by 2, your loop never stops. Why? Part of the reason? Because you started counting at 1. Let's do a little test here. Let's say that I am going to start at 0 instead of 1, and I'm going to increment by 2. What happened in this case? Once again, you can stare at this diagram and you can figure it out completely in your head. Some of you will be already capable to do that. That's great. Otherwise, what I absolutely want all of you to do is to make the effort for this beginning programming class to write things down on paper. So, initialize counter to zero. There we go. Enter the loop. Do some work. Counter is equal counter plus two. So now counter moves from zero to the value two. Is counter 10? Not yet. Iterate again. Do some work. Increment counter by 2. Counter is now 4. Is it 10 yet? No. Do some work. Increment by 2. Counter is now 6. Is it 10 yet? No. Do some work. Increment counter by 2. Counter is now 8. Is it 10 yet? No. Do some work. Increment counter to 10. 
Is it 10 yet? Yes. So we move on to the next statement after our loop. What is the outcome? Counter currently contains the value 10. It has been incremented by a step of 2 starting at 0. And my loop has been executed 5 times. So we went through an infinite loop to a loop executed 5 times, which makes sense. We count from 0 to 10, we increment by 2 each time. We are going to iterate 5 times. Okay, so this this series of examples should show you um, how it is, um, how much rigor it takes to write a loop that is correct. You need to carefully choose the initialization, you need to carefully choose incrementation, and carefully choose your test. Okay, we have illustrated how much the initialization is important. We illustrated how much uh, the incrementation step is also important. Let me take a last example on this slide to illustrate to you how much the test is important as well. So let me erase this and we're going to take yet another example. This example will be start counter at 1, increment by 2. So this is an example that led me to an infinite loop. Okay, And now that I am in this situation, I'm going to modify this condition and I'm going to use the condition counter is less a greater strict than 10. So I'm going to replace this condition by this one. What is going to be the effect? Once again we trace the execution of this program. Counter variable contains 1. I initialize it to 1. I enter my loop. Do some work. Increment by 2. Counter is now equal to 3. Is counter greater strict than 10? No. I iterate again. Do some work. Increment counter by 2. Now counter is equal to 5. Is it greater strict than 10? No. Loop again. Do some work. Increment by 2. Counter is 7. Loop again. Do some work. Increment by 2. Counter is 9. Do some work. Increment by 2, counter is 11, and now I test again my condition. Is counter greater strict than 10? Yes, and I'm, I am exiting my loop. Okay, so you see that there are like three different pieces to a, to a three important pieces to a loop initialization of the counting variable, incrementation of the counting variable, test of the counting variable to determine if you are done. One thing that this example didn't illustrate is am I better off with C greater than 10 or C greater equal than 10? Well this particular example didn't really lead us to a situation where that would matter, that would make a difference. But let's try to investigate this real fast, okay, to see another type of bug. The off by one is not really another type of bug, we discussed it already, the off by one bug, but in a different type of situation. So I'm going to erase this trace here, and I'm going to assume that I'm using now this condition. Okay, instead of counter being equal to 10, I test whether counter is actually greater or equal to 10. Okay, so I'm going to initialize counter to 1, and I'm going to use counter equal counter plus 1 every time. And I'm going to trace again the execution. So, first iteration, well even before the first iteration, counter is equal to 1. I enter my loop. I do some work. Counter is incremented to 2. Is counter greater equal to 10? No. I loop again. Do some work. Increment counter by 1. 3. And I'm going to try to stay uh, to uh, go through this loop a little faster, okay? Because I need to do it ten times. So, am I done yet? No. Loop again. Do some work. Increment counter. Counter is now four. Loop again. Do some work. Increment counter. Counter is now five. Loop again. Do some work. Increment counter. Counter is now six. Loop again. Do some work. Increment counter. Counter is now seven. Loop again. Do some work. Increment to 8. Loop again. Do some work. Increment to 9. Loop again. Do some work. 
increment to 10. So I'm here right now. Is counter greater or equal to 10? Yes, it is equal to 10. So I'm exiting my loop. What is the problem? Well, this is not an infinite loop. It finishes, obviously. So that's good already. Now, how many times did I execute the do some work? Nine times instead of 10. So this would not work. If I use C greater or equal to 10, it doesn't work. If I use C greater to 10, it works. So you have to be careful when you, when you design a loop, a counter-based loop, you need to know exactly how many times you need the job to get done. I want to repeat 10 times. And then once you know that, you will craft the initialization, the incrementation, and the test accordingly. A lot of students, a lot of beginning students, start writing a loop without even knowing how many times they want to iterate. It's kind of starting to write a letter to your friend without really knowing what you need to write in it, what you want to say to that friend. Okay, that can work in natural language. Okay, you can just ramble for like half a page and then you'll find something to talk about. In a formal system like a programming language, that will not work at all. So first, you need to know what you want to do. Then, you need to write down some code. Okay, design it to do this intent. And last step, you need to test that the code you wrote is going to indeed do what you wanted to do originally. Okay. We are pretty much done with this example. One thing I want to point out to you for, before we move on to another uh, code example, is that the test for the loop here could be located at different uh, stages of this loop. In this example, we are talking about a late test. Why do we talk about a late test? Well, you first do your work, you handle the incrementation, and then you have this test of whether you need to stop your loop or not. If you stop the loop, you go out. If you do not stop the loop, you don't do anything between here and branching back to the beginning of the loop. This is why it's called a late test. In this scenario, the test to decide whether you continue iterating or not is the last thing you do inside of the loop. There are other possibilities. Okay, We are going to explore them. So we are still dealing with counter-based iteration, but now we are trying to implement a counter-based iteration using an early test. This is an example of early test. The test, as you can see, is done first thing inside of the loop, right here. Okay, so this is another extreme. You do it last thing or you do it first thing. The loop has globally the same structure. Counter is initialized to 1. A test if counter is equal equal to 10. And once again, I apologize for this little typo here. I use the Java C++ notation instead of the Raptor one. We do some work. And then we increment counter by 1. Okay, and we keep looping like so. Well, what is the difference? There is a difference. So that introduces this um, this degree of freedom to write the loop differently, introduces uh, the potential for more bugs, actually. Let's have a look at what this loop is doing. Counter is equal to 1. Okay, I enter my loop. Is counter equal to 10? No. I do some work. Increment counter to 2. So I'm here. I go back to the beginning of my loop. Is counter equal to 10? No. I do some work. Increment. 3. I, I test if it's 10. No. I do some work. Increment. 4. Test. Do some work. Increment. 5. Test. Do some work. Increment. 6. Test. Do some work. Increment. 7. Test. Do some work. Increment. 8. Test. Do some work. Increment to 9. So I'm here. I test again. It's not 10. I do some work. So I'm here. I increment again 10. Go back to the beginning of the loop. Test again. It's 10. Therefore, I'm going out of the loop. How many times did I execute this loop? Nine times. So this is, again, a off by one type of error. So we need to fix it. Okay. My point here. It's just to show you how using the same type of uh, loop, how using a loop that looks very similar to the previous one except for the location of the test itself, can change the semantics, the meaning of the loop. That is, what it does 
in practice. So as you can see by now, there are a lot of things that you need to be careful about when you write a loop. Okay, um, the point of this lecture is to try to immunize you to all the problem you are going to encounter when you actually write exercise and write programs on your own for the first time. Uh, the idea is that I cannot prevent you from doing those errors probably, but I can at least warn you in advance so that when you commit those errors, when you are going to run your code and realize that you are off by one, you will have ideas on what can cause you and your program to be off by one. And then you will go back to those slides and you will reread them, you know, refresh your memory about what we discussed, and then you will go ahead and revise your code accordingly. Check that you use a good initialization, a good incrementation, etc. Okay? All right, so you can put your test at the end of the loop. You can put your test at the beginning of the loop. What is an over difference? involved by this. Well, another difference that we are going to discuss more specifically when we deal with Sentinel-based repetition is that when your test is at the beginning of a loop, you could have your test true at the first time. For example, if I initialize counter to 10, my test is going to be immediately true and I'm going to get out of the loop before to even execute even once the body of the loop, the content, the code inside the loop, okay? So, when you have an early test like that in a loop, you generally talk about loop which can be executed between 0 to n times. 0 because if the condition is true, as soon as you enter the loop, you never even execute once the code inside the loop, and n, well, n represent in this example, 10 times. But it's dependent of your problem. If you make a loop that's supposed to iterate 300 times, then n would be 300. How is that different from loops in which the test is at the end of the loop? Well, let's try to be logic, okay? If this is your loop, you have some work here, and then you have your test at the end, when you enter the loop, you're going to execute the code inside the loop at least one time before to decide if you need to continue iterating or not. So in this case, when you are discussing about early test, you have loops that will be executed between 0 to n times. When you are discussing about loops with a late test, you have loops that are going to execute their code, their body, at least one time, between 1 and n, n being like dependent of your program, of course. So this is one other difference, okay? Just by looking at the structure of the loop, you can figure out, you can give yourself, you know, a couple of hints about how many times can possibly this loop run. Some of them, at least once, granted. Others, like the, the early test loops, well, maybe zero. I need to look further into the program to decide exactly if they are going to execute zero times or not. So that can be an interesting feature that can be an interesting feature for example when you are like working on a program that will keep doing some work repeating some statement until the user says i want to quit well in some cases maybe the user starts your program the program sits on the screen for like five minutes and then the user realizes that he, he didn't need it, that program and wants to quit immediately without even running through your loop once well that would be the type of loop you need if, on the other hand, you want to write a program that is going to repeat a set of statements at least once in any possible uh, scenario, then you will want to use this kind of loop. Of course, you can put your, your tests at the beginning of the loop, at the end of your loop, or you can even put it in the middle. Uh, I'm not going to go into many, many details about this, speci this specific arrangement. One of the reasons is that while Raptor allows you to put your diagram just as you want, uh, when we use Java and uh, when we start making loops with Java, we are going to try to stick to, at least at the beginning, to loops with a condition that is at the beginning or at the end. The case where we test in the middle of the loop when we want, to, if we want to stop, uh, is possible in any programming language, including Java, C, C++, but this is not the basic case that we are going to start off with. So I want you to already know it exists, to prepare you for later on, but this is not the, the type of case that we are going to study uh, the most in this beginner class. So let me give you an example. You have your loop 
beginning here. You put your incrementation statement here. You put your test. So you did some work. You executed some code at least one time. You do some uh, testing, whether or not you need to stop your loop, and then you execute your work after. Well, as an exercise, I'm going to ask you to take this slide, and I'm going to ask you to trace its execution as we did with uh, the original example for this code. And what I want you to focus on is I want you to understand how this different disposition is going to affect the number of times the do some work statements are executed. Okay, start by using initialization one, incrementation one, and the test counter equal 10. Then try to do counter lesser, uh, counter greater than 10. Try to do counter greater equal than 10. This is going to be actually a good way for you to review the slides and make sure that you really understand what's going on. Okay? So I'm going to move on to the next slide, but please take the time to do this homework on this particular slide, slide number six. Iterative statement. We are done discussing the counter-based approach. And this is probably a lot of stuff to digest already. Uh, now we're going to switch to the Sentinel-based approach. Here's an example of Sentinel-based uh, iteration. I didn't want it to use a file to read the content of a file. This is an example I used at the beginning of this lecture to give you a, a taste of what Sentinel-based iteration could be. I do not want to use the example of a file because I do not want to teach you right now how to open a file, how to read the content, etc. We are still struggling with the fundamentals of programming, so let's keep it simple. We learn to play with strings, we learn to read input from the user, display output on the screen, and stuff like that. Let's keep playing with these capabilities until we understand how to program with loops and conditional. And then we'll move on to do things that are a little bit more uh, fancy. Okay? So let's have a look at this loop. The tag marking the beginning of the loop is here. We start by doing some work. And then we display on the screen one more. We read a viable response from the user, a string, and we test if the response is no. If the response is no, if this condition is true, we get out of the loop. If this condition is false, we go back to the beginning of the loop, we do some work again, and then we display one more, etc. So this is a Sentinel-based iteration because every time we loop, we are going to look for a specific data. We are going to ask data from the user, and we are going to look for a specific value, the Sentinel value no, to indicate that we need to quit working. Uh, this is not the most common Sentinel value uh, example that you will find if you look at over textbook, etc. The most common example of Sentinel value is writing a program that is going to keep reading integers between, let's say, 0 and 10 from the user, do something with them, okay, for example, sum them, and stop this process as, long, as soon as the user enters the value minus one. That is a value that is typically out of range of what we want to, uh, to process as far as data goes, okay? So, uh, this example we still do. It's very simple to, to understand, and that's why I took it, and it illustrates a different type of, of loop, looping strategy. Like the previous, uh, how to say, like the previous counter-based iteration uh, strategy that we discussed, Sentinel-based iteration also let you put your test at the end of the loop or at the beginning of the loop, early test. You will notice that in this version of the program, I start by asking before the loop start, do you want to do something? Do you want to loop once more? Then I start my loop, and I test this original response. If the original response was no, well, apparently the user started the code, started the program, but really didn't need it, and I get out of my loop. If not, I do some work. I display one more, so I repeat here the code that was there, and I go back to the beginning of my loop, where I start by examining my response, taking a closer look at my response. So this is the same ID, okay? Same ID than with the counter base. Uh, once again, I, I made sure that the code 
that I'm using here to illustrate the late test and the early test still does the same work. But you see that to be able to do the same work, I have some constraint to deal with. For example, if my test is at the beginning of the loop, then I clearly need to first display something and read a response outside of the loop so that I can do first thing in the loop, the looking into the answer, the testing the answer. Okay, I'll go back one slide. In the previous version, this was done here right before the test condition. What about the middle testing? Loop begins here at the top. I start the first half of my loop is going to be trying to get the user to tell me whether they want to continue or not, then a test, and then I do my work if appropriate. So by now, what I hope with those generic patterns is that you are getting a clear example of all the possibilities you have, all the degrees of freedom you have when you are writing loops. The second part of this uh, of this slideshow, and we have very few uh, slides left here, so hang on, hang on there. Uh, the second part of this slideshow is going to be closer to what we did with the conditional statement in module 2. We are going to discuss what happens when you have multiple loops in a program and how can you arrange them relatively to one another. Well, this is going to be relatively easy to go through if you understood well uh, what we discussed about when dealing with conditional statements. Here is a piece of code. Please pay attention to the fact that the execution will go like this, like this, and like that. Okay, it's just because, well, we don't have slides that are like oriented vertically that I had to uh, put the loops next to one another, where in fact they are one after the other. So we have here loop number one, that is a, a middle test type of loop. Okay, some work is done here, it's sentinel based. Some work is done here, the test is here, some of our work is done uh, if the test indicate I need to keep looping. And I keep going like this. This is my first loop. Once I'm done, once I exit this first loop, I follow this execution path, and I find myself here inside of loop number two. It's also a Sentinel-based loop with a middle test. Some work is done here. The test is right in the middle of the loop. And then some other work is done here if I just decided I don't need to stop yet. Once I decide to stop, I follow this execution path here, and I end up doing something here, a statement outside of both loops. OK, so once again, the live coding example are going to give you opportunity to test this on concrete problem. What I want you to understand here with this generic pattern is that these two loops are independent. If they were a counter based loop, I would use a variable c1 counter 1 here, counter 2 here, c2. Okay? I would use different uh, different variable because after all those loops are really independent. I'm going to maybe iterate 1, 2, 3 times here, then move on to the next loop and iterate 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, etc. 7 times in this one. The number of time I iterate in loop 1 doesn't have to be related to the number of time I iterate in loop 2 and vice versa. Okay? So when you serially arrange conditional statement, you make one test. And then regardless of the outcome of this test, you are going to make the second test. In the case of loops, same thing. I'm going to execute that loop, like if it's completely independent, and then move on and execute another loop independently, and then move on to maybe a third loop, etc. The second type of arrangement is a nested or cascading loops arrangement. Well, in this one, situation is a little bit different. I'm keeping the same type of loop, the same example over and over, so that I'm not distracting you by switching back and forth between example all the time. So we try to keep the same uh, loop, the same uh, sentinel based middle test loop, and I try to illustrate with it how it would be arranged serially, how it would be arranged uh, in a nested manner. Well, in a nested arrangement, here's what we have. We have a loop, let's call it loop number one. Okay. Does some work here. Test whether it's time or not to stop. If not, we do some other work here and then loop back. If it is time to stop, we loop out 
we break out of the loop and we go do some over statement that follows the loop statement. Okay, what's the difference? Well, the difference is here. And let me clear a little those scribbles so that you can really focus on what's important. The difference is right here. So far, I used always yellow box, you know, labeled, do some work, do some more work, etc. Well, what happens if I want to make nested loops? Well, if I want to make nested loops, this group of statement will look like this. I told you that inside of those yellow box, I could put anything. One statement, 200 sequ sequential statement, maybe 1,000 statement, including conditional statement, including maybe even looping statement. Iterative statements. Well, that's what we are talking about here. What about if I have a loop here, but inside of the body of this loop, inside of the do some work group of statement, I end up having another loop. That's possible. What happened? Well, loop number one and loop number two, they are independent. If they were counter-based loop, they would use you know, different counting variable, and they can both iterate for a variable number of time. However, the thing is that if I iterate three times loop number one, that means that I will execute this block of code three times. And then if inside of this loop here, I realize that I iterate nine times, what is the uh, uh, final outcome? Well, I am going to iterate nine times inside of this loop. Three times. That's 27 times that this work will be executed. Let me try to take a concrete example. Where do you find usage for nested loops in everyday life? Well, let's take an example. This is a podium of a classroom. These are the seats for the students. Let's say that we have rows of five seats. We have three different rows. My task, handing to each of those students, assuming that there is one student per table, handing to, out to each of those students an exam. What do I do? Well, here's what's going on in my, in my mind. Four each row. I'm going to do something. So that means I'm going to consider row number one, do some work. Row number two, do some work. Row number three, do some work. So that's the beginning of a loop, right? But what is a do some work? Well, let's think about it. Inside of the do some work for this first loop, I'm going to say my problem is I'm now considering a given row in that classroom. I need to go to each table and hand out the exam. So that's the job I'm going to have to do inside of my inner loop. Okay? For each row, do what? Another loop. For each table. And I'm going to abbreviate it tab. Inside of this loop, what do I do? Hand out exam. I abbreviate it. Okay? So here's how my program is working. A first loop for each row. For each row, this is going to be a counting loop. Okay? Counting loop because I have one, two, three row. Then for each table inside of each row, that's going to be a counting loop as well. One, two, three, four, five table per row. What do I do for each table in each row, I hand out an exam. So that's my action. Okay? How many times am I going to iterate? Well, the outer loop, the for each row loop, is going to iterate three times. The inner loop for each table loop is going to iterate five times. How many times am I going to handle to hand out an exam? Fifteen times. Okay? Three times, I'm going to repeat five times, ending out on exams. That's 15 times total. Okay? All right, we could think about, like, variance of this simple 
problem. For example, if there is not one student at each table, uh, how does it work? Okay. Well, then you could like start introducing a sentinel based approach. Let's assume that I ask all of my students to sit to the left. Okay. And leaving the empty tables to the right. So I can have some rows that have full students, some rows with only some student, and some rows with almost no student. What would happen in that case? Well, I could reformulate here my little loop algorithm. Okay, let me just erase this real quick. I could reformulate my little looping algorithm to say for each row. So that's my outer loop. And then the nested loop inside of it is going to say something such as for each student. The notation here, the formula, formulation I'm using, is a little awkward. Why? Because we're not talking about a program. We're talking about like, you know, giving instruction to someone to hand out exam. So if I wanted to make this as a computer program, I would have to be a lot more formal. But please bear with me just for the sake of taking, you know, a semi-realistic example and seeing how the logic of nested loops apply. This is really the focus of my explanation. Then when we move on to real programming exercise uh, in, the, in the second part of this module, you will have opportunity to rewrite this kind of statement using the right Raptor syntax, okay, and then later on the Java programming language syntax, uh, for example. So here the idea is, for each row, this is going to be a counter-based uh, iteration. There are one, two, three rows, and then the for each student, which really I'm not satisfied with the with the formulation here, but the idea will be to say for each row you are going to hand out an exam as long as there is a student on the table. So because I ask all of my students to compact themselves to the left, okay, I can start here, hand out an exam, hand out an exam, hand out an exam, and then, well, there's no student here. So I just don't do anything. Okay. As soon as I realize that this seat is empty, because I ask my student to, uh, to compact themselves to the left of the classroom, I can decide to stop for this row and not even go any further. Okay, so what would happen in this kind of framework? Well, I know that my outer loop is going to iterate three times. Now, how many times am I going to iterate inside of the inner loop? I don't know. I don't know because this is a Sentinel-based iteration. I'm going to consider the first loop and I'm going to iterate one time, two times, three times. So first row, I'll iterate three times. For the second row, I'll keep seeing so done, so I'll keep continuing up to five times. For the last row, one time only. So total iteration are going to be three plus five plus one. Nine iteration total because I have nine students in my classroom. Okay. So we are done with this, with this lecture. A couple of things I want to do before we, uh, we wrap it up is trying to give you some uh, a sort of summary, some sort of hints about the things that you really need to be careful about when you are designing your first loops. First thing, there are a lot of degrees of freedom for you to uh, do design choices. Okay, Do I go for a counter-based repetition, a sentinel-based repetition? Well, I hope that by now the ID between the two is clear. If not, please absolutely ask question on the course forum so that we can correct any misunderstanding you have there uh, from the get-go. Other thing, do I want to use early test? Do I want to use late test? Well, what I try to do in my explanation is to, to tie this decision to whether the loop should be absolutely executed at least one time or can be just skipped altogether. So that's a good starting point for a design decision regarding to that degree of freedom. And then, what about the conditional statement? Okay, watch out for infinite loop. Watch out also for uh, the, what we call the off by one bug. Okay, so when you write your conditional, you need to make sure that the Boolean expression you are using really means when it's true, I need to stop my loop. Okay, it's really, it's really a, a common error 
the first time you are writing loops to just write a conditional statement and just later realize that it's true when it should be false and false when it should be true. Okay, so pay particular attention to that. Pay particular attention to the way your initialization, incrementation, so I'm going to write this down here, initialization, incrementation, and test, all make sense towards the goal you want to achieve with the loop. So don't start writing a loop. Start deciding in your head what you want to do. Once you have this idea clear, then start writing a loop and craft the initialization, incrementation, and test aspect of the loop so that they match your initial uh, design for the loop. Okay? And I think we are pretty much done for uh, this lecture on iterative statements.